Our next speaker is uh, Zubaru Wai. Um, Zubaru is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science and Global Development Studies at the University of Toronto. He is the author of Epistemologies of African Conflicts, Violence, Evolutionism, and the War in Sierra Leone, which won the um, uh, Association of Third World Scholars Toyin Falola Africa Book Award for 2013, and is the co-editor of Recentering Africa and International Relations Beyond Lack, Peripherality, and Failure. Uh, his most recent manuscript is Thinking the Colonial Library, Mudembe, Gnosis, and the Predicament of Africanist Knowledge, which interrogates um, the contaminating vectors of the colonial archive and the implications for epi epistemic decolonization, uh, which will be published by Routledge early next year. Uh, Zubaru, please take it away. Okay, um, thank you very much, um, Bikram. Um, I want to start by thanking, like everybody else, uh, Radical and the International Manifesto Group for organizing this meeting and for inviting this presentation. And to you, Bikram, and my co-panelists, Nina, Matteo, Mano, and everyone who worked behind the scene to make, make, this, make this possible. And thank you all for being here. It is exciting that we are actually having this conversation at a time when there is almost a totalitarian ban on, on free speech the speech that is like sanctioned and the speech that supports the um, um, and political position of the so-called collective West. So thank you very much. Um, um, I feel alive. What I wanted to do, I, I titled this presentation, What Was the Sign of Libya? And um, given that I am like um, a hopeless, um, rebelling, um, I'm Catholic, I still once in a while go back to the Bible. So there is this part where Christ is asked and he's like a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall be no sign, but there shall be no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then he goes and then stuff, right? And I, the, 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 the capitalist and imperialist world is seeking after a sign. And the sign that I want to present is the sign of Libya. Um, we all know what happened to Libya in 20, 2011. Um, at the time, I was like really, really upset and I'm still upset at what happened to Libya. But the discourse is kind of similar to the atmosphere that has been created around the war in Ukraine, where you were not allowed to say anything that questioned um, um, the violent politics that was being unleashed right under our noses by creating what you want to call um, um, a moral panic about a deranged dictator that was giving Viagra to his soldiers to mass rape and murder his own people. Everything that we have now, we have now come to see uh, to be lies and falsehoods, but, but this was what was happening. And nobody, many academics, even those on the left, could not touch Libya. And the, the thing that was so crazy about this is that, of course, when it comes to Africa and, 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 and uh, nobody really wants, there is always this need that there is a cleansing power of liberal intervention when it comes to darker races and darker people. So going to Libya to free the Libyans from this deranged dictator was one that was even, like I was at York University at the time doing my PhD, Bikram was there respected Marxist scholars were supporting the NATO lie that they needed to go to Libya and destroy Libya. So I am still, so Libya was destroyed. And, and I was one of the few people um, that actually wrote on Libya and, and, and said, but this represents a very violent intrusion um, and almost the perfection of imperialistic violence and militarization. So this is the way in which I looked at it. But actually, even myself did not consider the full implication of what Libya means to what we want to call world order. So in this presentation, I want to return to Libya. And what I want to do is I want to start by saying that Lib Libya actually, the sign of Libya is that um, Libya is a, is, is a parallax. On the one hand, it is a sign of the spatial military logics of, lib of the liberal imperium, its oppressive powers, its totalitarian drive um, for world domination. So we've been talking about fascism, but it, the, 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 
the issue of totalitarianism is not even just in a particular system of governance in the West. The entire Western imperial system is totalitarian. Um, and, and Libya, of course, um, 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 really makes that very evident. And the second thing is that it, Libya also represents the militarization of, of, of global politics, the banalization of war, the routinization of intervention to advance and maintain the power of this totalitarian system that I'm describing. So on the one hand, Libya is a sign for the logics, the militaristic and imperialistic and totalitarian logics of our time, what happened to Libya. On the other hand, however, Libya is a perturbation to that system. Um, it is a perturbation and a reaction um, to the logics of empire. It indicates the limits of imperial overreach. And if you want to doubt this, you can look at the blowback that is still playing itself out, not only in the Sahel region. So, I mean, Niger just had a military coup and what they are doing is the French is now threatening to go back in. If our interest in Niger, basically the uranium mines are threatened, we are going to intervene. So they are actually saying this. So it's not only that, it's not like the violence and the, and, 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 and the reaction in the Sahel region of, 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 of Western Africa or not Western Africa, but it is also, we can also see that in the war in Ukraine. And I'm not even going to prevaricate around this and start um, mincing my words. The war in Ukraine, basically I am saying is that, is the lessons that are learned from Libya in a way that also is getting Russia to react exactly this, the way in which it is reacting. So, um, what it signals then, and we are in this moment where we are talking about hegemonic or, or, or the, the, the transformation of world order. World order is in flux. The, the liberal um, unipolar order that came into being, you could say, if you go with Fukuyama, it's 89. If you go um, with um, um, George Bush Sr., the first president, uh, it, it was after the Gulf War when he was trying to put in the new uh, um, world order. So you could say from 1989, 1990 to 2002, or again, there you could say um, 2014 with the Maidan revolution or the Maidan coup in, in, in Ukraine or Russia's uh, military action in Ukraine in 2022. But this is the period where you had on parallel li liberal um, militaristic power that was suffocating everything out. So for the past 30 years, it was the American-led liberal um, 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 militaristic system that was dominating um, global spaces and the re reaction to that in 2022 by Russia. Okay, so what I basically, in the paper that I, the paper that I published in 2014, I had attempted to consider the implications of Libya, not only for hegemonic rearticulation, because the argument that I was making was that Libya actually provided an opportunity for the West that was suffering a crisis of hegemony in the Middle East to be able to rearticulate itself as the defenders of democracy. So a moment of hegemonic unraveling also became a moment of hegemonic rearticulation. So that was the part of the argument that I had made and I had made and also made the point that Africa was central to this notion of world order and the projection of Western, Western power. And the conclusion of that paper was like, and I wrote at the time is that as the liberal world order attempts to monopolize the global sphere and concentrate power in a technological machinery of violence and domination, and as it suffocates life through a totalitarian order that frowns on alternative modes of life, ways of being, forms of thought and forms of knowing, and as it entrenches itself and attempts to concentrate its authority in a singular imperial network of power dominated by the United States, it also becomes vulnerable to its own violent and destructive in inclinations. I wrote this not realizing the full implication of what it meant. And if you are wondering what the implication of that is, Ukraine is the implication. We are now talking about the end of the unipolar moment. 
even realists are now saying we're in a place where now we have like a multipolar world order. At least there are three dominant powers, Russia, China, and the United States. So, and, and part of the reason why I was saying that um, the, the, the liberal world order, the American system was undoing itself was because every machinery of domination, um, Baudrillard tells us, always also secrets the counter apparatus and agents of its own destruction. There can never be an imperialism without an anti-imperialism. That's, that's really the point that I'm making. There, there can never be a dominant power that does not also have opposition to, to, to its logic. So even, and, and Radhika is right, they're saying that even when the US tried to say we are hegemonic, we are dominant, you could only be dominant insofar as um, um, you try to, to like snuff out alternatives, but there are always forces that are articulating themselves in opposition to that domination. So, and for us to be able to understand then how um, Libya is central to the moment that we are in, maybe we have to, to actually take a longer history of view, I'm sorry, a longer view of history. The United States have always tried to be the dominant power in the world, at least post nine, I'm sorry, post the Second World War. Sorry, Bikra, how many more times? Do I? Oh, okay, right. And so um, at the end of the Second World War, normally like when I was in school, for instance, we were taught that, uh, oh, part of the reason why the anti-colonial struggles um, um, succeeded was because there were new powers, the Soviet Union, but also the United States was against the empire. Actually, that's a lie, right? Because what the United States was trying to do is that the old imperial order that was based on Europe, it's like, well, we are now the new ones. And for them to be able to create this larger imperial order, they didn't need um, colonialism in the old sense of the world where you actually occupy territory. What they needed was an informal empire that was based on, and we saw that in the Bre Bre Bretton Woods institution, um, the arrangement, the United States dollar became the dominant currency. You had capital controls, you have fixed exchange rate, and the, the, the policy of development that Truman puts in place. But initially, it was articulated as one world vision. The, the Soviet um, um, uh, um, rebellion leading to the Cold War then basically meant that one world vision had to be put up, but the US never forgot about its imperial order. So one world vision then became free world vision. And so in the 90s, with the end of the Cold War, that the US idea of always being the dominant power was now realized with the end of the Cold War. And then 9-11 happened. So initially they were trying to like really go about it um, in a very violent way, but in a nice way in which they will say, oh, we are just promoting democracy and this. And then 9-11 happened. And it revealed, the, the title of that paper that I wrote actually is The Empire's New Clothes which is like playing on the emperor's new clothes to say there is naked violence that is embedded in this system that is being dressed up as, 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 as liberal um, and concerned for freedom and human rights and all of it, right? And so from this, in the second world war, I'm sorry, from the end of the second world war up to the 1990s, the Cold War was on, the Americans were unable to really realize their informal empire, even though they were racking up violence, targeting communism, um, alternative forms of, of, of socialist organizing and nationalist ideas. All of this, I mean, Africa has the scar of this. Angola, South Africa, Namibia, um, Algeria, you, 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 you name it. And then the Cold War ended and Bush was like, okay, one worldism now could be realized in the new international order. Okay, and so with the end of that, um, with the, sorry, with 9-11, with when the Americans have become so violent and reaction you, in the Middle speaker. East through the so-called um, uh, Arab Spring, there was the crisis and that crisis had to be mediated. And the only way to mediate that crisis was to go after Libya. But the argument that I'm making then is that going after Libya also actually sowed the seed for the destruction of this moment because Putin was not president of Russia at the time. But if you listen to his speeches around this period, he was very angry at what was happening. The Chinese, their embassy had been bombed already in Yugoslavia in 99. And then Libya, and they were lied to at the United Nations. 
So when the same thing repeated itself in, in Ukraine, basically it got to the point, what the Russians were doing, we need to rebuild our productive forces. That's why everybody was like, why didn't you intervene in 2014? Because if they did, their economy will have been destroyed. But between 2014 and 2022, they were actually able to extricate themselves in a little. And China was able to rebuild itself, um, I mean, advance its economy in a way that created the possibility for what Russia is doing. And that is now responsible for the conversations that we are having at the end of this um, violent system. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there because we're running out of time. But the point that I'm making is that then we have to take Libya seriously and we have to take the forces that were articulated, the pro politics that was unleashed in Libya is central to understanding what is happening in Ukraine and what is happening in the world in terms of rethinking world order. I'll stop there. Thanks. I'm Michael Hudson. I'm appearing here for the International Manifesto Group. If you like this video and want to like it, please subscribe. For more information, go to the address on the screen.